Good evening, and for those of you joining us from across the country and around the world, good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar on inhaled nitric oxide. I am Amy Leitman, president of NTM Info and Research, and I will be serving as moderator for today's session of Science from Your Sofa. On behalf of all of us at NTMIR, thank you for joining us. We'd like to thank Beyond Air for working with us to organize what is sure to be a fascinating and informative webinar. Today's webinar is titled Saying No to NTM, Investigational Use of Nitric Oxide as an Antimicrobial Agent in Refractory NTM Lung Disease. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Rachel Thompson and Mark Brimkus as today's featured guest speakers. Dr. Thompson is a thoracic physician and lead of the Bronchiectasis and Mycobacterial Diseases Research Group at the Gallipoli Medical Research Institute, University of Queensland. She conducts specialized mycobacterial clinics at Greenslopes Private, the Prince Charles, and Princess Alexandra Hospitals. She has an international reputation for her research into lung disease due to non-tuberculous mycobacteria, currently focusing on immunological and environmental aspects of susceptibility to NTM infection, characteristics of the lung microbiome in NTM, and improving treatment outcomes. Mark Rimkus is the Vice President of Clinical Affairs at Beyond Air. He is a professional biomedical engineer and registered respiratory therapist with over two decades of experience with inhaled nitric oxide systems at various companies and hospitals. Mr. Rimkus received a BSEE and BSc from the University of Alberta and a respiratory therapy diploma from Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. During today's webinar, you may ask questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Click on the Q&A icon on your screen, type your question into the box, and then click send. At the conclusion of the presentations, the moderator will read questions from the queue for our presenters. Today's webinar is broad, broadcast is being recorded and will be posted online at a later date. So if you miss the answer to a question that's asked, you'll have the opportunity to hear it again later. Our next webinar will mark the launch of our wellness webinar series on mental well-being with presenter Dr. Devin Smith of National Jewish Health. The first topic will be Sleep 101, Sleep Basics and Solution for Improvement on Sunday, June 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Registration will open at the end of this month. You can learn more about NTM Info and Research and sign up for our electronic news at ntminfo.org. And you can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Dr. Thompson and Mr. Rimkus, thank you on behalf of the NTM and bronchiectasis community for taking the time during an important clinical trial and an undoubtedly busy time for our, to, take, to come to our educational series. Now I turn this event over to you. Thanks, Amy. I'm just get my slides up. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, so as you know, we're going to say no to NTM with nitric ox oxide, and I'm going to talk you through uh, some of the work that's been happening in this area. Um, I don't know how to go forward. Uh, my disclosure is that I have been a consultant to Beyond Air for the design of this study, um, and previously consultant to some other pharmaceutical companies unrelated to this material. Um, uh, and Mark, apart from uh, being a consultant to Beyond Air, doesn't have any other disclosures. Um, so first of all, I, I realise that this audience is very well familiar with NTM lung disease, so I'll be fairly brief in just uh, going over a couple of the aspects. But as you know, the symptoms of NTM disease uh, can be quite uh, debilitating. The chronic cough and sputum production, recurring infections, fatigue, weight loss, uh, night sweats um, and low-grade fevers, um, and eventually shortness of breath as the disease advances are particularly troublesome for our patients. Um, we know that NTM are widely found in the environment, particularly in water and biofilm sources within our homes, um, in soil and household dust. But the uh, niche for each of these species in di is different, uh, and there's likely to be multiple modes of acquisition uh, of the organisms from the environment uh, in patients, both within their homes and in hospitals. We recognise that there are two common forms of disease in the lung. The most traditionally recognised is the fibrocavitary form, which is predominantly an upper lobe uh, process, although can involve other lobes of the lung. Uh, Initially, this was thought to mostly uh, be present in males who were smokers with underlying COPD. 
Um, the organisms are usually easily isolated from the sputum and they're usually monoclonal, that is they're a single strain of the species. Um, sorry, um, fibrocavitary disease, however, has become increasingly recognized, particularly, um, this is the wrong sli slide, um, sorry, it's a slide missing. Um, but the uh, uh, nodular bronchiectatic form of disease is also increasingly recognized. And um, we uh, certainly have a lot more females, middle-aged to elderly females with bronchiectasis and nodules that often have no smoking history, uh, no underlying lung disease. Um, and this organism causes a progressive bronchiectasis. It's often um, a polyclonal infection and patients can acquire different strains over time. The incidence of disease is rising around the world and there's certainly a geographic diversity of disease. Um, with different species being dominant in different uh, countries, uh, which was published in a paper in 2008, as, uh, sorry, 2013, we published that. Um, and then looking closely at Queensland where disease is notifiable, uh, we've seen a significant increase over the last uh, 15 years in uh, disease, mostly due to MAC, but also due to some of the rapid growers, including Mycobacterium abscessus. Um, a decision to treat a patient with NTM disease can be quite difficult uh, because we're all exposed to these organisms on a day-to-day -day basis. Our immune system does have some activity and is constantly fighting off all of the things that we uh, breathe in and out from our environment. Um, the decision gets down to factors that relate to the organism, whether there are other organisms present, um, whether there are the bacteria are there in a heavy load or whether there's only a small bacterial burden and the virulence of the different species. So some species have uh, more tendency to form uh, cavities to be more aggressive uh, and associated with uh, deterioration in lung function, whereas other species can be more indolent and grumble along with very slow progression. The host factors are also important um, and there are some prognostic factors such as very low BMI, high inflammatory markers, low protein levels and anemia that can uh, herald one to think that this disease is of poor prognosis. Um, the presence of cavities is a poor prognostic sign. Patients who continue to smoke uh, don't do themselves any favours because cigarette smoke paralyses the macrophages, which is the, are the cells that help to gobble up these organisms in the lung. Um, so the frequency of infections and the patient's symptoms also help in determining the decision to treat. And this decision is, is a difficult one also because the treatment is not straightforward and can be quite challenging. These are the latest um, NTM guidelines published by the ATS and IDSA. Um, and the guidelines really haven't changed a lot, but you can see for nodular bronchiectatic disease, we use a combination of three drugs, azithromycin, rifampicin, and ethambutol as first line. And these can be given three times a week. Um, if the patient has more se severe disease, and particularly uh, if there are cavities present, then we would recommend this treatment be given daily and we consider the addition of intravenous amikacin or even streptomycin in some parts of the world. And then if the patients have refractory disease, the treatment is the same, although we have a newer option in the addition of amikacin liposomal inhalation suspension, which was shown in a randomized control trial to improve uh, the sputum clearance rates for patients with refractory disease. The treatment duration is usually approximately 18 months, 18 to 24 months, but it's often longer as patients can take quite a while to clear the organisms from their sputum. Side effects are reasonably frequent from these regimens and we often have to resort to second line drugs. And the success rates are incredibly variable um, from anywhere from 50 to 80% for MAC disease. And clearly options for patients with refractory disease and shorter courses um, and more effective regimens are sorely needed. With Mycobacterium abscessus, it's actually harder to treat than multidrug resistant TB. And this is a typical uh, treatment schedule for someone who has abscessus disease. We usually have an initiation or intensive phase of intravenous therapy combining imipenem, tigacycline, amikacin. Um, 
with azithromycin and clofazamine, followed by a maintenance continuation phase, which is a co usually a combination of oral antibiotics plus or minus nebulized amikacin. And again, the duration is, is fairly long. There's a lot of monitoring for toxicity and side effects are frequent. This form of treatment can be quite hard going. And the results are not ideal for patients with the subspecies M. abscessus. The uh, sputum conversion rates vary from 25 to 42% in these three published series. They're somewhat higher if you have the Mazziliensi subspecies. Um, uh, and clearly we could do better. So this leads us to look at alternatives to antibiotics um, and uh, previous investigators have looked at nitric oxide as an antimicrobial agent. Nitric oxide has several roles um, in the human body. It does play an essential role in host defense mechanisms at various sites of the body, including the lungs. It has antibacterial activity against multiple bacteria, including Pseudomonas, Staph, E. coli and MRSA. And its mechanism of action there is attributed to DNA damage, bacterial enzyme inhibition, and induction of lipid peroxidation. You can see on this graphic on the left that it does have other effects in apoptosis, angiogenesis, neurotransmission, cardiovascular homeostasis, and immune responses. In cystic fibrosis, it's particularly interesting because cystic fibrosis airways are deficient in nitric oxide. And patients who have higher nitric oxide production do seem to have better lung function. Um, nitric oxide donors can increase CFTR expression and maturation. Um, and nitric oxide is a regulator of bronchodilation and mucociliary activity, in addition to its antibacterial benefits. In a preclinical setting, these in in vitro experiments, um, inhaled nitric oxide has a demonstrated dose response effect after 10 hours of continuous exposure to various different uh, various clinical isolates of M. abscessus. At 250 parts per million, uh, NO shows significant bactericidal activity, um, even with intermittent dosing, which would uh, mimic the sort of dosing we are looking to use in patients. On the left here, you can see the blue bar, blue graph shows the control uh, isolates um, with no exposure and the red with 160 parts per million, green uh, 250, the purple 300 and the orange curves 400 with uh, exposure over time. And you can see the reduction in log CFU per mil um, on that graph. And you can then see on the right hand side the effect of intermittent 250 parts per million nitric oxide um, on an M abscessor strain. So taking this further, we then um, look at the effects of nitric oxide in, in conjunction with antibiotics that we use for um, both MAC and M. abscessus. With the addition of clofazamine um, or amikacin, you can see there is synergy demonstrated here. Each drug was uh, combined with three hours of exposure to nitric oxi oxide. Um, in the orange and brown, particularly these two bars on the graph on the left, you can see the orange bar represents clofazamine alone and uh, at eight microgram per mil concentration um, and the effect of it compared to the blue bar, which was no drug. And then you can see the addition of nitric oxide brings that uh, concentration of organisms down uh, as shown by the black bar. And then the brown one shows a slightly higher dose of clofazamine um, with a similar effect. The right hand side shows quite a dramatic effect uh, with the addition of nitric oxide to amikacin with a significant reduction uh, in bacterial load at both eight and 16 micrograms per mil of amikacin. So what's been happening in the clinical world? The high concentrations of nitric oxide are quite safe and have been well tolerated to, do to date. They've been administered in over 140 patients uh, in nine different clinical settings, and there haven't been any serious adverse effects um, reported related to the nitric oxide. And these studies have varied from patients, uh, healthy patients to those with uh, viral bronchiolitis, uh, cystic fibrosis patients, and some with uh, NTF, including M. abscessus. 
Um, methemoglobin is a well-known biomarker for the safety of nitric oxide administration. Um, some background to this, um, hemoglobin is a molecule in red blood cells that helps carry and distribute oxygen to the tissues in the body. And methemoglobin is an alternative form of hemoglobin that's unable to bind oxygen. And if you have more of this, then your um, oxygen levels tend to reduce. So when you deliver high concentrations of nitric oxide, it binds with the hemoglobin in the blood and forms methemoglobin. So we have to monitor the methemoglobin levels and maintain them below 10%, because if you keep them less than 10%, there's no clinical effects or effects on oxygenation uh, in the body. This formation of methemoglobin is temporary, and when it's delivered intermittently, uh, it actually drops down to normal levels within two to three hours after each dose. Uh, this graph shows the effect of intermittent nitric oxide dosing on um, methemoglobin levels. And as you can see, it peaks after the dose, but drops down very quickly um, over the course of the ensuing couple of hours. Uh, this was uh, data, this data comes from rodent and canine models that uh, use nitric oxide of 200 to 400 parts per million and showed that it was quite well and self, uh, well tolerated um, and safe. Um, and in a clinical study, which I'll expand on a little bit more uh, in the nine subjects that were treated with 160 parts per million five times a day, um, uh, the methemoglobin levels were all uh, quite acceptable. So we're looking to target refractory NTM lung disease. Um, these are patients who have persistent infection despite treatment and symptoms that are not, not improving with the traditionally available medications that we have. Um, one of the initial studies was done uh, as a case, uh, case study using uh, NO in a compassionate use capacity this was a 25-year-old cystic fibrosis patient who had an eight-year history of chronic M. abscessus infection, unresponsive to multiple antibiotics with deteriorating lung function, hence not really many options available. Uh, this patient was treated for uh, three weeks at 160 parts per million, 30 minutes uh, per treatment, five times a day for the first two weeks, and then three times a day for the next week. Um, they were monitored continuously for oxygenation, methemoglobin levels, uh, FiO2, NO and nitrous oxide monitoring were also done. And the outcome measures were lung function, six minute walk distance, quality of life and sputum mycobacteriology, which were, assess were assessed at baseline during the treatment and after. This patient reported, uh, tolerated the treatments very well and the methemoglobin levels didn't ever get above 5.2%. Oxygenation was very stable and they demonstrated improvements in uh, lung capacity, six minute walk distance and inflammatory markers. But with this short duration of treatment, there were no significant changes in um, abscessus counts by smear or culture. Um, there were large improvements in quality of life, particularly related to physical vitality, health perceptions and respiratory domains. And following this three weeks of therapy, she was actually able to complete a college degree and hold down a job. Um, so there have been a few other studies on um, NO, intermittent dosing for the treatment of NTM lung disease. Um, there have been a few compassionate use pa access patients, uh, as you can see there are three or four there. Um, there was also this pilot study done in Israel of nine cystic fibrosis pa patients, um, which I'll uh, talk to a little more now. Um, so this, this study uh, really um, demonstrated a, a significant benefit for these patients that um, was inspiring to take the, the treatment further. Um, so there were nine CF patients with refractory abscessus infection uh, treated at three different centers in Israel. Um, they all had a background um, in M. abscessus antibiotic regimen. They were given 160 parts per million via mask for 30 minutes, five times a day for two weeks and three times a day for seven days. Um, and this was all administered in hospital. So it was a three week confinement for these patients, which is not an, not an insignificant undertaking. Um, the primary endpoint of safety was met with no uh, serious adverse events um, noted. 
And the key endpoints of six minute walk distance and FEV1 uh, responded positively. And certainly the quality of life data showed positive trends. Um, now you can see that the met hemoglobin levels went up and down with treatment, but all always came back down after each dose. Um, they didn't ever get above 5.2%. Uh, um, with 10% being our sort of ceiling level of tolerance. Um, the six minute walk distance improved on therapy, unfortunately dropped off a little bit off therapy. Um, but the benefits seemed to last for about four to six weeks after the treatment was stopped. Um, and there was an improvement in uh, FEV1 from baseline. So the study that we're undertaking now is using um, the lung fit device uh, to treat patients as outpatients. Um, as you can see, con confining patients to hospital is a significant limitation of nitric oxide treatment that has been used to date. So um, this lung fit device enables us to be uh, treating patients in their own home. This is a 12 week stu study and we aim to enroll 20 patients with either cystic fibrosis or um, bronchiectasis associated with refractory uh, MAC or abscessus infections. Um, we did begin screening in December, 2020. Unfortunately, last year we were delayed significantly by the effects of the COVID pandemic, but we were able to do dose the first patient in February and uh, she actually finished her treatment last week. Um, the patients are admitted to hospital for the first five days of the treatment so that we can titrate the dose up from 150 parts per million for the first 24 hours, then they have 200 parts per million for the next two days, and then if tolerated move up to the 250 parts per million uh, at which stage they're discharged. Now each, each dose lasts 40 minutes um, and is uh, at least four hours apart. Uh, we're monitoring uh, met hemoglobin levels, uh, oxygenation, uh, blood pressure, and the usual things in hospital. And the patients are also wearing a Fitbit uh, tracker, activity tracker for the two weeks prior to the study, during the track study, and we'll continue to wear it after the study so that we can get uh, independent um, uh, measure of physical function. But we're also closely looking at quality of life, uh, bacterial load and culture conversion. So the first two weeks of treatment go for four times a day and then the patients reduce to uh, twice daily treatment up to day 84, the maintenance phase. And they all remain on their uh, background antibiotics and we will then be following them up, them up for a few months after the study to see how long that benefit may last. Um, so I'll hand over now to Mark, who's going to tell us uh, more about the, um, the device. Um, Great, thank you, Dr. Thompson. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about our device here. Um, so the LungFit Go device, it's a nitric oxide generator. So what it does it takes room air and um, ex converts a very small amount, 0.03% of the nitrogen and oxygen in that air and converts it to the therapeutic dose of nitric oxide. With, so so um, it uses a plasma arc technology. It provides air that's um, that's in the room that you're breathing normally and, and just converts a small amount of it. It's very simple and safe to use. Uh, mass is about eight kilograms, fits on the tabletop. The only thing you have to do is, um, it's really what's on screen here. You plug it into a standard electrical outlet. You turn the device on, you put the circuit on, pay, place the mask on your face. You insert a smart filter, which I'll talk about in a second and you press go. Um, really, it, that's all there is to it. The, the device monitors all inhaled gases. It measures the nitri nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen levels. Um, every, all the gas that's breathed in has integrated alarms on all of those parameters. And it has safety shutoffs. If, if there's ever a parameter that's, out of an, uh, that's in an alarm condition, it can stop generating nitric oxide instantly. And the only thing you breathe after that is just straight room air. So it's very safe. There's no 
compressed gas that's associated with it. Um, it's it's really really a, a very simple device. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the smart filter that we use. Um, basically, the the filter itself it removes any nitrogen dioxide from the delivered gas. Nitric nitric oxide combines with oxygen to slowly form nitrogen dioxide, which um, you can tolerate in, in only small amounts. So the filter removes any of this nitrogen dioxide from the delivered gas uh, before it reaches the breathing circuit. We say it's smart because it contains all of the information on it that's needed for treatment. It has a small electronic chip on it and that contains the the animal concentration for the dose, the time of the, the length of the treatment, the total gas flow, and all associated alarms, plus the time, the, the updated time of the treatment. So for, for anyone, Dr. Thompson mentioned that um, there are three doses with it. You don't have to program the concentration in. You put the filter in, the, the Lung fit go immediately gets the information from it. Uh, 40 minute treatment, the dose 150, 200 or 250 ppm and the, um, the total gas. So as you're, once you press play, the, there's a timer on the, the device that counts down for the treatment time. Um, if you have to pause it during the treatment, you, you press the, the pause button it just stops the nitric oxide generation and it also stops the timer. So when you um, resume the treatment, it, it starts counting down at that point. When it reaches zero, it just stops generating nitric oxide. You can take the mask off your face at any time after that. You don't have to um, look at a clock. You don't have to time the, the um, treatment. You don't have to worry about, about it going too long or not long enough. And after, after you're done with the treatment, um, you just dispose of the filter in regular regular waste. Um, the, and it, since it keeps the time on the filter, another great part about it is that you can't reuse a filter. When, once the filter times to zero, it knows it's at zero. If you try to plug it into a unit, it'll come up as zero. Perfect timing with the next slide, thank you. So this is the circuit that we use. It comes pre-assembled in a, in a package. Um, there are three sizes of masks. It's a, it's a CPAP mask, so it's made to be comfortable to wear overnight to, to create a seal on your face. Um, there are, so the, the biggest difference between our device and something like a CPAP device is that there's no pressure in the circuit. It, um, when you you secure the mask to your face, you seal it with, with the head harness. Again, um, simple to apply and, and creates a, a gentle seal. When you breathe in through the mask, then it, you breathe in the gas that's circulating in the circuit. And the, there's a little um, valve on the end of it. So when you breathe in, it breathes through the gas from the circuit. When you breathe out, it exhales the exhaled gas, exhausts it into the room so that you don't rebreathe your gas. It measures the the gas right by um, where you breathe it in. So you, we have accurate levels of nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide. Um, it's very simple to put on. There are three sizes of masks to accompany all, all um, facial sizes. And um, that, that is um, basically all there is to it. It's, it's a very, very straightforward device, very, simple to use um, in the hospital or at home. Um, and we're, we're very happy with, with um, its performance and being able to showcase it with this trial. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. That was very informative. Um, we're gonna take some questions now. We have some up already in the queue. So unsurprisingly, the first question is, when, when can we do this new treatment? I'm ready for anything non-toxic that will help me breathe. <laughs> well, that depends where you live. 
if you live in Sydney or Queensland, New South Wales or Queensland, Australia, then uh, you just need a referral and we could consider you for the clinical trial. There's, the trial's been done uh, in Sydney at the Macquarie Private Hospital and in Brisbane at the Green Slopes Private Hospital. Um, but yes, if you're willing to travel, you can be part of it. Um, can, can you, sorry, go ahead. No, you're right. We can we can at least consider you. I can't promise you you would be eligible, but um, can you um, just sort of discuss a, a little more um, in a little more detail some of the risks involved with with the nitric oxide? Um, so most of the risks are really um, theoretical risks that haven't been appreciated in the studies that we've done so far. Um, the, there is a potential risk that uh, nitric oxide may affect uh, platelet aggregation or may affect the risk of bleeding. Um, and there have been some studies that um, have supported that, but mostly they haven't. So it's conflicting uh, information there or conflicting results. But if somebody's had a lot of hemoptysis, that means if they're coughing up more than 30 mils of blood in 24 hours, then we would not really consider them for the trial because of that potential risk. Um, but really patients who've had any hemoptysis through the trials that have been done so far and the patients that have used it off label, we haven't seen that eventuate. Um, the, um, the drug does have quite a short half-life, so um, it whereas as you can see the methemoglobin levels recover very quickly, that's because the nitric oxide has quite a short um, effect and that's why we need to administer it so frequently. So um, I, I think that possibly contributes to uh, the lack of side effects that we see. Um, there are a few other side effects that are mostly related to high dose continuous exposure in really sick patients um, like neonates with advanced uh, lung disease uh, and also patients that are on ventilators in the intensive care. But in adult patients without those severe problems, um, we haven't seen any significant effects. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from someone, a patient that has, they are colonized with pseudomonas, prior history of fortuitum that converted to negative after two years. They now have abscesses and they are wondering if they uh, would be considered a candidate for the study, possibly. Yeah, that would be considered a can candidate. Again, it depends where you live and how prepared you would be to travel. Okay. Um, another question with mycobacterium tuberculosis, nitric oxide can be bactericidal depending on the dose and time of exposure, but at static concentrations, it antagonizes the action of several antibiotics. Um, is this a concern? Um, look, again, I think it, it gets down to the intermittent dosing. Um, so, so maybe I, I don't know how long that phenotypically typically tolerant state lasts for, um, and and I would think that at intermittent dosing that you may not have such a problem. One of the things we have um, that that has been sort of postulated is in some patients we've seen an increase in abscesses in sputum after the start of the treatment and we think that's because the nitric oxide helps to break down the biofilm and release organisms from the biofilm so you may actually see a transient increase and that effect and the other bactericidal effects may actually more be more beneficial than the effect on these particular drugs. And with abscessus patients, they're not usually on rifampicin and ethambutol, so um, it shouldn't be such a problem. With the MAC patients, we haven't really, uh, th this is the first study to look at the, the device and nitric oxide in MAC patients. So it will be interesting to see how they, their outcomes compare to the abscessus patients. Um, so we have several questions asking about the availability of the device, which since it's in clinical trials, it's, it's not commercially available. Um, but just because it's, it's in trials now, um, I don't know, could, could either of you speak to um, any thoughts as to, um, you know, plans for the future to, you know, for looking to have it have it go into further clinical trials um, 
either in Australia or the United States or other areas? Has that, have, has, has any of that ever been discussed yet or, or are we still away from, away from that? Uh, I think we're a little away from that. There's, there's a whole lot of questions about where this device might fit into the current treatment regimens and, and looking at the, um, the potential for different dosing regimens. Should it be used one week out of four? Should it be used three months at the start and then not again? Should it be one month every six, one month every... How, how it fits in is, has yet to, be, um, is yet to be worked out. I mean, we take it one step at a time, evaluate this 20, 20 patients that we're looking at now and see how long that benefit lasts. And then I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion about where to next um, with this. But, but it's a bit, it's, it's still early days. Um, so we have a few questions about the mask um, asking, you know, does it need to be sterilized? How often does it need to be sterilized or cleaned? How do you do that? Mark, would you like to answer those? For sure. So the mask, um, it, its cleaning regime is basically it follows what a typical CPAP machine um, mask would be. So you can clean it with soap and water whenever it's soiled. If, if um, you know, there looks like there's any debris on it, it's, it's safe to, to wash like that. Um, typically you, you wash them anytime between one, once a week and once a month. Um, it doesn't have to be sterilized. It, you, the mask stays with the person and it's just like, like a CPAP mask. It's, it's not um, sterilized between uses. Okay. Um, has nitrous oxide, a nitric oxide, I think was what they, uh, has nitric oxide been successful with other bacteria than abscesses? Has it been tested on MAI? Um, it's certainly been tested against other bacteria and other NTM. And yes, there is some evidence that it's beneficial um, or bactericidal. Um, but that question, the person who's asked that question does uh, raise an important clarification point that nitric oxide is not nitrous oxide. Um, many of you who've had babies and been through childbirth may have received nitrous oxide. Or if you uh, picked up by an ambulance with a child with a broken bone, they'll give you the little laughing green stick and that's to help with pain relief. That is nitrous oxide, um, otherwise known as laughing gas. This is not nitrous, it's nitric, slightly different. Thank you. Um, so we have another really good question actually. Um, does the device record any data that can be sent to the provider? Um, they're wondering about telehealth monitoring using the device on and off for the long-term treatment. Mark? Sorry, I was muted. Um, it, currently it, it does not because it's an experimental device. Um, it does have an internal log that, that does contain all information for um, treatment time and any alarms that go off, but it's not be, because of where, where it's at in its development and the, the treatment um, it is just not, not set with that um, operability. There's nothing preventing it from if, you know, everything goes perfectly and if it ever is a commercial device, of course, that would... Um, be built in for that time. Thank you. Um, could this treatment potentially be com combined with another type of therapy such as phage treatment? In the future, there's, there's a whole lot of options of um, combining it with other things. But right now, um, for the purposes of the clinical trial, the patients need to be on a stable NTM regimen for the 30 days prior and preferably that's not changed um, throughout the study so that we can best evaluate the effects of nitric oxide. Um, how do we, how does somebody get in touch uh, about the study, about possibly participating, I guess? Um, well, you could go through the uh, Gallipoli Medical Research Foundation website. There's a link to our clinical trials there. Um, and I think uh, uh, also if you were to, um, I guess, uh, contact the NTM Australia group, um, we could 
they could pass on your details and we could get in touch. Uh, the other place that's uh, recruiting is the um, Macquarie Private and Lucy Morgan is the principal investigator in New South Wales. Um, so I'm sure we, we can help you somehow there. Okay. Um, you will need a referral from your uh, physician or general practitioner. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. Um, is there any kind of expected uh, negative conversion um, with nitric oh, look, how What are the expectations for negative to, for conversion to negative using nitric oxide? Well, we don't really know. This study is predominantly a safety study um, and a feasibility study to see that the device can be used at home and, and used safely at home. Um, and we're looking at, at uh, sputum conversion, certainly, and we're looking also at uh, sputum bacterial load. So if you don't convert to negative, does it actually reduce the bacterial load in sputum? So we are assessing all of that. It's very difficult to know how long you need to treat to achieve conversion. And so um, we're certainly looking at that. We're hopeful that it has an effect on um, bacterial conversion because of the in vitro data that's provided. Um, but these patients are, have refractory disease. And so um, it's always gonna be a challenge to convert them within three months of an additional novel therapy. But the quality of life, activity data, safety data, that's all very important um, information that we'll be determining from the study. Um, are um, patients with uh, M. Micilliens infections included yes. in this trial? Yes. Okay. Um, and if somebody, you know, usually you, you had mentioned that um, a lot of times patients are under, already undergoing treatment and it's, it's used on refractory cases. Um, how, how do you determine then um, what, what's actually making the difference in, in terms of what's working for the patient? Can you, can you go into some detail on that for, for well? Audience? Everything, we try to keep everything else the same. So the patients have to have had NTM disease for at least six months prior. They need to be on a stable regimen and their cultures still need to be positive. Um, so we assess the patients at screening first to see where everyone's at. Um, and if they don't fulfill those criteria, then they're not eligible for the study. Um, so they do, and they're, they're then assessed again um, a couple of days before the admission for the start of treatment, just to make sure that nothing's changed. And during the course of the three months, um, we don't allow the addition of any new antibiotic therapies or anything unless it's really for um, life-saving uh, reasons. We try to keep everything as stable as possible so that all we're assessing is the effect of the nitric ox oxide. Okay, um, so if the effect of nitric oxide on meth, meth hemoglobin levels is a risk to be monitored, would low hemoglobin levels disqualify a patient from participating in the trial? Yes, we do require a hemoglobin of 10. Um, the other um, exclusion is if you've got a, a, an abnormal type of hemoglobin, and we, unfortunately one of the patients we screened did have um, a thalassemia trait, which is a different form of hemoglobin, um, and those patients aren't eligible as well. Um, somebody is asking about the connection between uh, this therapy and cystic fibrosis. They, they're, they're, they're noting that it seems to be used quite a bit with CF patients, and they're, they're wondering about the connection between that and NTM and whether also what, you know, can you talk about whether this is um, going to be used um, you know, with yeah, so the, um, the original study was done in cystic fibrosis patients with NTM disease, not just cystic fibrosis. Um, and so um, it's, I mean, that's because there are some, the theoretical benefits that of, of nitric oxide in patients with CF that I outlined in the, in the talk, but um, we're really interested in, in its effect as a antibacterial agent against NTM, but with its other potential side effects, so to speak, or positive side effects that it may have uh, in cystic fibrosis as well. So we're not really, I don't think this is exclusively cystic fibrosis, but there are a lot of CF patients who are suffering from refractory NTM. So obviously it's an important option for those people. Um, do you have the studies so far indicated that nitric oxide treatments have to be continually used for long lasting effects or repeatedly 
you know, used, um, or do, you know, do infections recur when the patient stops? Um, so that's one of the big questions we're trying to answer with this study. The first study was done with um, three weeks of treatment and that benefit lasted for about four to six weeks after stopping. We don't know what the safety is in continuing this indefinitely. So we've chosen a three month period of treatment um, and we'll assess the benefits of that, the tolerability and safety of that. And then we will follow those patients up and see how long that benefit lasts. That doesn't mean that the next study won't be for six months or 12 months, that it may be intermittent therapy instead of using it every day for all of that time. It may be for one month out of three or three months out of 12. Like all of those questions are still um, yet there to be answered. And until we get more experience with the use of the device and we get the, this basic uh, safety data and, and effectiveness data over a longer period of time, it's really hard to say where this is going to fit in definitely in the future. But that's the same with all therapies. You know, with all antibiotics, we're co constantly trying to work out how to use them better. You would have seen from the guidelines, we've gone from daily to thrice weekly because, treatment with antibiotics because we worked out that you didn't need it to need daily therapy to be as effective. The duration of treatments in antibiotics is also currently being worked out um, on a, a, a regular basis. So the same has to be done for this treatment. We have a question about Pseudomonas. Has it been tested specifically on Pseudomonas or have you had patients with co-infections with Pseudomonas and have you observed anything about it? Yeah, it has been tested on Pseudomonas in vitro and it does have an effect. And um, I think in a couple of the patients that were involved in the initial studies, they also had Pseudomonas as a co-infection and there was um, so there were two patients in the cohort from Israel that were co-infected with a multi-drug resistant pseudomonas and um, at the 11 week follow-up they both had negative cultures for pseudomonas so we do think that it, it probably has a role to play there. Um, have you had a chance to observe it either in vitro or in trials on other infections such as staph or you know other unusual gram negatives? There is some in vitro activity against staph, but I'm not aware of um, the clinic whether there's been much clinical clinically observed benefit in the patients that have been treated so far. There was only one patient with staph in the Israel cohort, um, and I'm not sure whether they. Uh, cleared that staff or not. I'm not sure that it's um, mentioned. So uh, yeah, there's certainly potential benefits for other organisms. Um, what about patients who don't uh, really generate sputum or don't produce, don't have productive coughs? Um, for the purposes of the trial, we do, we do want to get some um, evidence of bacterial conversion. So we do want to get some cultures at baseline and um, through the treatment at the end of treatment. Um, and so it, there is also the possibility to have sputum induction done with a physiotherapist and hypertonic saline nebulization prior to the sputum collection at, at screening. And, and if we can get a sample at screening doing that, then we would consider, um, consider enrollment. Uh, and go to the next is the next question says is Australia allowing Americans in if fully vaccinated? <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet. <laughs> it's not even allowing Australians in. So, <laughs> not yet. Um, okay. Well, um, thank you. I, if anybody has any more questions, now is the time to type them in the queue. Um, but thank you for answering that last question. We look forward to the day when everybody's allowed to come to Australia. So hopefully someday we'll be able to come visit um, and you'll be able to come back here. We're, we're not allowed out at the moment either. So <laughs> well, we, we can leave, but we won't be allowed back. Uh, we have another question. Is there another trial that's going to be starting at some point? Um, and, and will it be rolling enrollment? They want to know when is it starting and can they sign up? <laughs> um, I, I can't answer that right now, but um, we'll be sure to let you know through Amy and NTMIR when and, and the various social media platforms will be sure to advertise and let you know when there, there'll be further opportunities. Okay, thank you very much. 
everybody, thank you so much for attending. Um, we really appreciate you being here today. Um, don't forget to join us for our, our next webinar next month. Um, thank you again, Dr. Thompson, Ms. Dr. Rimkus, for the excellent, wonderful presentation um, and for taking the time to be with us, especially Dr. Thompson. You're, it's, I think it's like tomorrow already for you. <laughs> I think it's actually Friday for you. So um, good morning to you and everybody else. Good evening. Um, good night. And thank you so much. Oh, wait, we I'm sorry. We have, oh. One more question, one more question before we go. Do you have to do nitric oxide and antibiotics? Uh, for this study, yes. But if you had been on antibiotics within the last 12 months, and for whatever reason you decided to have a rest or a break from them, then you can go back onto them for the 30 days prior to the study. You just have to be on a stable um, regimen for 30 days prior to the screening visit. Okay, um, and we have one more question. Will the recording of this webinar be available? Yes, it will. In a few weeks time, we'll have the webinar up on our YouTube channel and it will be captioned at that time. Thank you everybody for attending. Everybody have a good evening and have a wonderful weekend. And thank you so much for attending. Good night, everyone.